I'd like to welcome everyone to uh, the justice section today following the Home Secretary's speech. Uh, this session was meant to be led by uh, Lord Clark, Ken Clark, interviewing uh, the Lord Chancellor, and I'm very sorry that he can't be with us. He is uh, and has been, you know, a a fantastic lawyer, politician for so many years, uh, an MP for 50 years, uh, and was in fact Secretary of State when uh, you came to Parliament, uh, Robert, all those years ago. So I'm sorry uh, that I'm standing in for him uh, today. Um, but I'd like to um, talk to you, Robert, about um, what you want to achieve. We do know that, uh, well, I know, having spoken to you many times, that you think every department should be a justice department, and there is a real importance in the justice system. What do you want to achieve as Lord Chancellor and Secretary of State? Well, uh, becoming Lord Chancellor was really the... Uh, the latest stage on a, quite a journey for me through the justice system, both as a barrister, as a part-time judge, as a parliamentarian representing constituents with real issues. And now, after the best part of 30 years in the system, I have a, a great opportunity to make the change that I felt has been needed for so long. And I think there's one word that really sums up what I want to achieve, and that's confidence. I want a higher degree of confidence uh, amongst the public that the justice system will deliver safer streets, uh, better communities, and be the end product of a, a whole government approach, which does involve every department, making sure it's doing its part to uh, prevent people from getting into the system in the first place and to reduce the risk of crime, because crimes cost our country billions of pounds. In fact, the latest estimate was about 18 billion pounds being ca caused by re-offending. And now, now, it's not just a financial cost, there's an emotional and a societal cost as well. And therefore, if I, uh, you know, will look back upon my, when I look back upon the time that I've had in office, if I've been able to achieve a higher degree of confidence, then I will be satisfied that my work was not in vain. Uh, those are all very, very important uh, things. And you, you, you really focus there on confidence, which is absolutely important. Do you think uh, that the sentencing white paper uh, that you uh, published last month is key to that confidence in the justice system? And what do you want to achieve through that sentencing white paper? Well, the sentencing white paper, the policy document that is the blueprint of our plan, was a vital uh, uh, staging post to announce our intentions, not just in terms of changing the law, but also changing the way in which the justice system works. And you, as the Minister of State for Prisons and Probation, will be playing a key role in making sure that those services are uh, reformed and are improved in a way that I think the public will approve of. I think the sentencing white paper really comes in it in many different ways. Uh, we are dealing with serious and dangerous offenders in a more robust manner by making sure that they uh, serve greater parts of their uh, sentence in custody. But at the same time, we're doing more to deal with uh, community sentences, to strengthen mental health treatment, to improve drug and alcohol addiction programmes, to uh, really embrace electronic monitoring and to use tags in a way that perhaps we haven't seen in this country before, all underpinned by radical reform to the probation service, a ramping up of the number of probation officers, uh, and a real sense, again, of bringing together agencies like the police and the probation service to supervise offenders more effectively in our community. The sentencing white paper uh, takes a smart approach to sentencing. And what I mean by that is an approach that uh, uh, makes sure that we are using our resources in the wisest way possible to uh, not just protect the public from serious offenders, but also to reduce re-offending that we know is a real problem when it comes to uh, that cycle of crime that, that is all too familiar to many people listening, uh, and which is a real blight on a lot of our communities. 
Reducing reoffending is, is really important, and I know that as uh, much of my time is spent uh, in our department uh, working on how we reduce reoffending, stopping that cycle of crime, as you say, and letting people turn their backs on crime. But also as a constituency MP, I'm very aware of uh, the importance that we have of ensuring that justice serves victims. You know, I remember going to constituency meetings where people, surgeries, people have come to me and they've said, you know, I, I, something terrible happened to me. I was a victim of crime and I want to ensure that I get justice. What are, what are you doing to ensure that victims do get justice? Well, well the department uh, and I work very closely with victims groups and other organizations that uh, eloquently advocate on behalf of uh, those people who uh, uh, totally through no fault of their own end up in a system that can often feel alien uh, can feel uh, lengthy in terms of process and a system which um, isn't necessarily geared to their welfare or their interests as well as it should be and that's why it's incumbent upon us to to continue to press forward with reforms to the system. So very shortly we'll be publishing a new revised victims code written simply and clearly in a concise way to help victims navigate their way around the system and we're going to go one stage further and underpin that with a victim's law to enshrine the rights of victims to be consulted, to have information, to have all the sort of support that uh, frankly is uh, taken for granted in other areas of public life to be enshrined in law so that there is uh, an obligation upon uh, the Ministry of Justice, on all the agencies working within it to uh, put victims at the heart of the system rather than as a an afterthought mm. or an add-on, which frankly has been the case for too long. I'm, I'm very keen. I've asked some of the key questions, I think, that uh, are asked of me from time to time. But I'm very keen to get your questions in. So do uh, put questions in, because uh, I'd like to uh, ask uh, the Lord Chancellor some of your questions. Um, but just uh, while I'm waiting for some of those, I'd like to touch on something that you talked about, about reducing reoffending, which is very close to my heart, as I mentioned. And I did a panel the other day and I spoke to a, a, a young gentleman uh, who had been uh, an offender at 18. He'd, uh, he'd committed a number of knife crimes and he'd spent time inside. But he'd come out, he was then 27, um, and he, he said he was working for a charity that helped other people turn their lives around. Mm. Um, and I said to him, how many people do you think want to change? How many people do you think we can help, you know, with the support such as the support you're giving? And he said, 100%, because no one really wants to be a criminal. So what do you think the key things that we're doing in the department are mm -hmm. to stop that cycle of crime and reduce that reoffending? Well, I've heard that story and many others like it, not just as Lord Chancellor, but as a practitioner, representing young offenders, meeting victims of crime, meeting uh, people who have ended up into a cycle of criminality and who frankly don't know how to get out of it. And I think there are three things that uh, any responsible government should be seeking to do when it comes to reducing reoffending. That is a home, a job and a friend. And by that I mean accommodation, stable accommodation. I mean a job uh, and a friend could be in the form of treatment or some sort of supervision that ensures that people are making the right choices rather than reverting back to a life of crime. I've seen the results. Uh, where it works, it means that people turn away from that cycle, but we've got to do it better. And this is where the other departments of state come in, this is where local government comes in, and not just government, but also the private sector, industry and business. You know, yesterday I was on a, uh, in a very interesting fringe meeting at, here at conference, talking with uh, not just um, a private enterprise who was employing people with previous convictions, but a charity and indeed a, uh, a worker who himself had been in the criminal justice system. And again, the message was very clear that where we can bring the private sector, charity and government together, we can start to nail this problem. And our ambitions in this area are high. Uh, the Prime Minister believes fundamentally in employment as a way out of criminality. Uh, and I'm supported by my friend, the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, and indeed other ministers in the cabinet who share this bold ambition. And we'll be hearing more about the detail of this in the weeks ahead. 
I think you're right. I mean, when I meet businesses who employ ex-offenders, they say, you know, contrary to their uh, perhaps initial expectation, they are loyal because they've been given a chance, you know, and, uh, and, they, and they respect that and they work harder. And, you know, there's a recent YouGov uh, study which says, you know, most, uh, I think 75% of people would be happy to be served by uh, an ex-offender. So we need to change those perceptions. And I think, you know, you and uh, others in government are making great strides in that area. What we do, and it's companies like Timpsons, Greggs, other uh, uh, large companies, and often very much smaller enterprises that are making that leap of faith, but are finding a great reward in, in the commitment and loyalty of the people who are working for them. Uh, you know, I think there's a combination of things we can do. Yes, changing the culture is one of them, but also looking at ways in which we make sure that uh, the system uh, doesn't unintentionally hold people back from employment. And that's why in the Sentencing White Paper we are looking at, uh, with the necessary safeguards, uh, reducing the time in which somebody has to declare a previous conviction to an employer, or practical measures designed to make sure that we have a ready supply of uh, people who are able to work, particularly at a time when we are looking at the labour market, working out where our source and supply should come from. And frankly, I think you know, these people, these ex-offenders, uh, you know, we need them. To, to get into the labour market to do those jobs that um, we, we have a shortage of supply in at the moment. Yes. Now, we're, we're uh, having this conversation now and obviously all the things that we've touched on are absolutely critical, but we're doing it against a backdrop of COVID. Um, and, you know, as a prisons minister, I know the challenges that we've had in prisons and obviously courts as well. You know, how do you think the justice system has reacted uh, to the COVID pandemic? Well, the pandemic uh, posed a peacetime challenge to the system like no other. And I know both you and I and fellow ministers were working and continue to work daily uh, to look at the operation of each element of the Ministry of Justice. And in prisons, we were faced with some pretty stark uh, information and uh, evidence about the potential danger of the COVID uh, uh, pandemic to the system. Uh, as a result of the incredible work done by Her Majesty's Prison and Probation Service, the prison officers, uh, the support staff, everybody w linked to it, we managed to contain the virus to a very low number indeed. And although we did suffer some uh, deaths, the number was below 30. And I think that that was a testament to the uh, coming together uh, of various elements of government and our daily dedication to making sure that the pandemic didn't become uh, a disaster, frankly, in the system. Uh, and then on the court side, unlike virtually every other jurisdiction, we didn't close for business. We kept the courts going through the crisis and we started jury trials up earlier than anybody else. Uh, we're now running uh, well over 100 to 150 jury trials every week in England and Wales. Uh, I think our friends in Canada uh, might have just started back up again uh, uh, with one or two trials, but it shows the degree of uh, organisation, of dedication and also um, uh, imagination to get things moving. And through the combination of uh, perspex and other uh, safety measures, we've managed to open, open more and more existing courts. And I've announced uh, various uh, um, uh, uh, new initiatives with Nightingale Courts. We now have, uh, we'll have by the end of the month about 30 courtrooms additional to uh, normal capacity uh, and indeed a whole range of different measures being taken across the country to uh, build back better and to uh, also deal with some of the existing caseload that I know was a concern to many who are anxiously waiting to either give evidence or see the outcome of the case in which they were a, a, a complainant. I'm very keen to get some more questions in um, from uh, those uh, watching um, but uh, whilst I again wait for some very interesting questions that I hope, hope will come through. I thought I'd touch on something that it's asked to me uh, a lot, which is about the professions. You know, they are critical to the running of the justice system, particularly the criminal bar, uh, but of course the, the civil bar as well, criminal solicitors, you know, everyone has their part to play in what is uh, one of our greatest service industries, uh, which helps provide the bedrock of justice. Um, what are we doing? What, do, what are you doing? What 
do you want to do more to protect the professions which are upholding the rule of law? Well, as uh, um, somebody who was at the bar for over 20 years, uh, I feel a deep commitment to the ethos and the independence of our legal professions who uh, are, are part of what uh, we describe as our rule of law approach in the UK. Without them, uh, the system just would not work. And therefore, it's uh, the duty, I think, of uh, any Lord Chancellor to make sure that those professions are uh, uh, adequately resourced, that they are in a uh, position where they can uh, provide that vital service. And I think in the, in, in the sphere of criminal legal aid, we've already announced important additional funding to uh, criminal legal aid fees, and we're going to do a wider review of the system because I want to make sure that we have that range of providers out there, criminal solicitors and barristers, doing the work that I did for so many years in South Wales. But it doesn't stop there because, as you say, we have a vibrant uh, uh, legal uh, services industry both here in London and indeed in uh, across the country, uh, which provides a huge amount of uh, not just um, uh, gross domestic product here, but also as an export value too. And Britain and England and Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland, the three jurisdictions' reputation as world leading centres for litigation, arbitration, and dispute resolution means that uh, we stand in a very good position indeed to be a, a global beacon of rule of law and legal process, of course, underpinned not just by a uh, a robust and independent legal uh, um, uh, um, uh, legal uh, profession, but also a world-class judiciary. And the judiciary that we have here in England and Wales and in Scotland and Northern Ireland, uh, I think, is second to none. We've just celebrated the opening of the legal year on Thursday. That, again, is a timely reminder, not just of the ancient traditions of our legal system, but of the enduring power of the rule of law and the message we can send to uh, fellow jurisdictions in the Commonwealth uh, and I think of Hong Kong as well at this time and I think of uh, all those jurisdictions uh, in other parts of the world that sadly face direct challenges to their independence and threats to the rule of law that we must be vigilant uh, about and stand uh, shoulder to shoulder with uh, fellow legal colleagues across the world to defend. You're right to say that we are a beacon of justice and many countries look to us. Um, and there are, I think, some advantages and some possibilities and opportunities in the uh, trade negotiations that are coming up. Uh, but uh, I've got some, uh, some really interesting questions uh, that have come in. So I'm going to turn to one of those. Um, why is it that foreign criminals can stay in this country even after they've committed a crime? Do you think this needs to change? Well, the question about foreign criminals is one that has long bedeviled the system. The uh, government and indeed the Ministry of Justice, the Home Office, work tirelessly to uh, effectively uh, deport and repatriate criminals who uh, do not have British citizenship. So when their uh, sentence is uh, served, uh, we uh, have a presumption uh, for everybody who has a sentence of more than 12 months that they should be deported. However, that takes the cooperation of the, the country of origin for it to work effectively. And whilst we do uh, deport many thousands of offenders every year, uh, I get, and I know the Home Secretary as well, we both get frustrated at the fact that there are uh, often obstacles in our path because other countries just won't recognise their responsibility and, and accept back the individuals who uh, need to be removed from our jurisdiction. Um, I think the uh, combined approach of the Ministry of Justice and the Home Office and the sense of energy that we have about this means that we are already making inroads into those numbers. But I believe that uh, with the robust proposals that we've heard today from the Home Secretary, coupled with a renewed sense of purpose about the way in which we manage these foreign offenders, we will start to see better results in the years ahead. You know, the way that we manage them in our prison system is, I think, vastly improved from only a few years ago. Uh, and we 
are very conscious of uh, our duty to make sure that uh, these people are uh, um, uh, not lost in the system and not, not sort of left or disregarded once their prison term is up. Uh, I, 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 whilst I, I do not underestimate the difficulty of this challenge, I, I do think that in this government you have a combined purpose and a, and a political will to, to uh, improve the current situation. Now the questions are flowing in thick and fast um, and I'm going to pick one uh, on prisons because obviously that is a, 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 an area very close to my heart. Um, so how are we keeping our prisons more safe for staff? What are you going to do uh, to make them safer? Well, the prison building programme, which uh, will be the biggest in a generation, I think, uh, is an opportunity for us to provide uh, more modern, new and better space, not just for prisoners, but also for staff to work in as well. We've just seen the near completion of the new prison at Wellingborough. We're about to embark upon more prison building. In fact, the when the Prime Minister came into office last year, one of his first announcements was a £2.5 billion investment into prison building. And it's important because it will create the safer space, uh, the better environment in which staff can work. And also, when the PM came into office, he made an announcement of a £100 million investment in uh, airport-style security in more and more of our prisons. And since then, despite COVID, we've started to roll out this programme to uh, many, many reception prisons, particularly those prisons where uh, there's a particular vulnerability to not just... Um, uh, safety but also contraband and items being brought into prison that really shouldn't be there and I know that prison staff are delighted to see this investment they feel valued they feel safer and it is making a huge contribution I think to uh, their sense of well-being but there's more that can be done I'm particularly concerned about assaults against prison officers this is why as a result of a consultation we've just completed the government will legislate very soon to double the maximum sentence available for an assault on an emergency worker, which of course includes a prison officer. It'll go up from one to two years. And indeed, the message has gone out very clearly that where assaults on prison officers occur, we will not tolerate them. And we, won't, we will see more prosecution and much more, uh, a higher degree of justice for those uh, valiant prison officers who are on the front line doing everything they can to make our prisons safe and to protect the public. Yeah, you're absolutely right to talk about the value of the prison officers and the important role they're doing. And they are you know, some of our hidden heroes during this crisis of doing a tremendous job. And I've heard reports of prisoners you know, going out and recognising that the, the prison officers are coming in, um, you know, risking coming in and uh, given the virus. Um, I'm really, really grateful for the work that they do. I ju we haven't got very much time left, so I'm just going to get in one further question. Yes. And you might need to keep your answer short to this because we're running out of time, unfortunately. But it is a topic that comes up a lot in Parliament, I know, which is about terrorism. And someone's asked, how can we better use the justice system to keep terrorists off our streets for longer? Well, we've already taken decisive action in the wake of the Fishmongers Hall and Streatham atrocities by passing emergency legislation to end the automatic early release of terrorist uh, offenders. That was at a stroke a way, I think, of safeguarding and protecting uh, the public from terrorism. We are currently legislating even further to create uh, stronger and tougher sentences for the most serious terrorism offences and to make sure these people are monitored for longer once they're their release. The combination of legislation plus increased investment into counter-terrorism, an extra 20 million in the last year alone, now brings uh, the amount uh, invested into counter-terrorism uh, uh, up to nearly a billion pounds. We are spending that in a way that doesn't just incarcerate, but also works to prevent and deter and protect members of the public from the risk of future terrorism. It's a constant battle, Lucy. Uh, we have to be vigilant about all types of terrorism, but the government is absolutely dedicated to uh, dealing with this scourge and to keeping our streets safe. I'm, I'm not sure whether that brings us to the end. Oh, have I got time? Because I think this is a question from my uh, uh, constituent. Ah. 
um, which is great to see. So, James, thanks very much for your question. Um, what advice do you have for young Conservatives looking for a career in law or politics? Well, James, I, I think that uh, the future is bright. Uh, I think that uh, we actually need, I'm going to be controversial now, more lawyers in politics like you and me, uh, because uh, I think the law teaches you about the need to base your decision making on evidence, but it also gives you a sense of uh, justice, if you like, a sense of outrage on behalf of the people you're representing, which I think makes for a very, very good constituency MP or councillor or elected representative. You've got to have an interest in people first and foremost if you're really going to be an effective particularly a criminal lawyer uh, and I would say that the future is there open for uh, any young conservative who wants to uh, uh, you know get into the world of law uh, and develop their skills uh, politics I think should be a calling uh, I think the law has certainly taught me so much about uh, who I am and what I can contribute and frankly, it made me, by the time I got elected, I think a, a better politician uh, and more informed about the people who I represented, the people who, despite the fact that they may commit serious offences and may uh, end up in custody, uh, still need representation to underpin the principle that we all live under the rule of law and that we're all equal under the law and those principles must endure. And as Lord Chancellor, I will continue to uh, stand up uh, for that. Well, I, I obviously agree with you. I think uh, law is a, a great uh, basis for politics uh, in terms of the skills and understanding of the society that we all represent. Um, I think that might be uh, where we have to leave it. Uh, but uh, thank you very much, Lord Chancellor. And I'm sorry that, uh, again, that we didn't have uh, uh, Ken Clark uh, interviewing you yeah. today, but I'm sure that will happen on another occasion with uh, his incisive questions uh, and great expertise. But thank you very much. Thank you, Lucy.